of it. It's great. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to our event today with two names you often see topping the national bestseller list, Lisa Unger and Mary Kay Andrews. My name is Louisa Smith, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Mysterious Press, buying director for Book Passage Bookstore, and the very lucky host of today's event. I would first like to thank all of you for being here. We know that you have lots of options for how you spend your time on a lovely Tuesday like this, so thank you for choosing to spend your time with us. Book Passage has a robust events program, both in-store and online, in no small part due to supporters like you. I hope you will have a chance after today's event to visit our website and see who else is coming. Today, we are celebrating the newly released Christmas novella from Lisa Unger, Christmas Presents. Um, Lisa is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author with books published in 33 languages and millions of copies sold worldwide. 
she is widely regarded as a master of suspense. And coupling picturesque, cozy setting with a deeply unsettling, suspenseful plot, Christmas Presents is a chilling seasonal novella that can be enjoyed all year long, where a instead of presents, a true crime podcaster is opening up a cold case, discovering that the truth is more terrible and much closer than she realizes. Lisa herself describes her dark take on the holidays as Lisa Unger ruins Christmas, which I absolutely love. <laughs> And I agree with what beloved horror novelist R.L. Stein said, which is, if you're looking for a warm, heartwarming story of holiday cheer, this ain't it. This book is a cold-blooded, nasty thriller. I love it. And joining Lisa today is another of her favorite authors, Mary Kay Andrews. Mary Kay Andrews is the New York Times bestselling author of 30 novels, a native of St. Petersburg, Florida. She earned a BA in journalism from the University of Georgia. After a 14-year career working as a reporter at newspapers, including the Savannah Morning News, the Marietta Journal, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, where she spent the final 10 years of her career, she left journalism in 1991 to write fiction. Thank goodness for us. Mary Kay has a fabulous new Christmas novella of her own titled Bright Lights, Big Christmas, which celebrates the magic of Christmas and second chances. Filled with family ties, both rekindled and new, and sparkling with Christmas magic, and all tied up in a hilarious romantic gem of a novel. As Debbie McComer says, no one does Christmas like Mary Kay Andrews. And the best part of these live events is that it allows you, the audience, to ask your own questions of our authors. So if you have a question for either author, please enter it into the chat, and we will try to get to as many as possible towards the end of the event. We will also be posting links for both of their books, and we have signed copies of Lisa's Unger's book, and we will have signed book plates of Mary Kay's. And with that, I would love to welcome both of you to the event. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us, Louisa. Glad to be here. Oh my gosh, Mary Kay, you're amazing. You're a powerhouse. I just <laughs> oh, I, and I absolutely love this book. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what it's what it's about? You want everyone to fill yeah. In? Um, I wanted to um turn the Hallmark movie trope on its head. Yeah, uh, you know, in the Hallmark movie trope, um, the big city girl goes to the small town, and she meets a man who has a toy factory or a candy cane factory, um, and in when she gets to this small town, um, her big city cold, cold, big city heart is melted and her life changes. So I wanted to turn that on set. In Bright Lights, Big Christmas, a, a girl, her name is Carrie, from a small town in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Her family grows Christmas trees and every year for the past 40 years, they take a camper, a vintage canned ham camper, and they live in it and they set up a Christmas tree stand in the West Village. So Carrie goes, she lives in this little camper with her um, gruff, older brother um, who snores and his dog Queenie who farts and um, they sell trees and she finds magic and she rediscovers um, she rediscovers her passion for for being creative and that's a little bit about what it's about now Lisa hmm. you know I, we talked a little bit about I kind of look for the light um, what in whatever kind of book I write I, I write books with some crime in them you, on the other hand, seem to seek the shadows. I do. I do seek the shadow a little bit. And in fact, like when Otto asked me to write a Christmas novella, I was like absolutely thrilled, you know, because I just love a glittery thing, you know, a sparkling glittery thing, because I just want to like break it open and see what's inside, you know, like that's just, I feel like whenever there's, wherever there's light there, there's also shadow right and I sort of I, I I do I do like to go there so this seemed like a perfect and I had already had this sort of idea kind of kicking around my head when he asked about it and so it seemed like the perfect opportunity to write my very first Christmas of all you're the queen of Christmas but this is my my very my very first one and so this is about um a young woman named Maddie and she is you know a a a survivor of some terrible trauma and she's kind of clawed her way to this life of the independent bookstore owner so she has a lovely little shop in um, a small town called little little valley and she is um you know preparing for the season when um uh 
podcaster, a sort of an unethical podcaster, drops in to her store. And he's not just there to buy a book for his dad. He has some questions about um, Madeline's trauma and the things that she's endured in her childhood. And um, it's this moment where she has to kind of confront things that she has buried deep and look for answers to some questions that, you know, she hasn't wanted to um, look at at all. And uh, it's the story of how that unfolds as a, as a blizzard bears down and Christmas is right around the corner. So has she, would you say that um, she's been living a half-life? I would say that. Yeah. She's, you know, she's, I, I kind of felt that she was very, at the beginning of the book, when I first started, you know, spending time with her, I felt that she was very sort of cocooned. You know, I think most of us who are readers, you know, like lifelong readers, you know, you can, you can kind of lose yourself in, um, in stories and maybe sometimes it, it helps you to escape from, from your own life and examining your own past. And so she's, she's, she stayed in the same town where these horrible events happened to her. She's the, she is the uh, lone survivor of a, a serial killer and um, somebody who killed her best friend and is p- potentially possibly they think responsible for other murders as well. And she's like living in her childhood home. She's taking care of her dad who is, you know, who's suffered a stroke um, and he has been living his life sort of obsessed with this case as well and some of the unanswered questions. So, you know, she she has been sort of living a half-life, you know, but she's been, you know, she's been kind of in a stasis until Harley Granger shows up with his questions. Yeah, I am. And I loved um, the relationships in the book. I loved um, that she's helping care for her dad. Um, but there's somebody kind who mm-hmm. also is there and helping. And I loved her re- relationship with her best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I mean, that's really like, for me, that's always like, you know, the most important part of, of every book, right. Is how, how the characters relate to each other. I mean, it's the most important part of life. So of course it's the most important part of fiction. And I felt the same way um, as well about, about your book, I know you said that you were you were trying to turn the sort of the trope on its head, and I love the way you brought Carrie to Greenwich Village, right, and then turned it into an actual village populated by these wonderful people, including people that we know, <laughs> which was such a thrill for me when I was reading your book. Um, and you really explore very deeply those relationships, and I think in a lot of ways you know, Carrie and Murphy are, you know, really, you know, living, you know, they're, they're, they're also living half-life, maybe not quite in the same way, but they're right. both waiting to kind of emerge, like to become, you know, right. Murphy been like, you know, sort of under his dad's thumb a little bit with the Christmas tree farm and, um, and Carrie's been like, you know, maybe doing a job that she didn't really want to do she's got some deep creative aspirations you know and ta- and talent so maybe talk a little bit about the relationships in your book yeah Carrie um her parents split up when she was seven and she goes to live with her mom who's a school teacher in the village in this little town in, Nor- in North Carolina her brother Murphy's four years older he stays on the Christmas tree farm with his dad and and so he's been go- making this trip to the city every year all these years. And so this year, um, their dad, Jocks, had a heart attack and Carrie gets guilt tripped into making the trip to um, to the city. And, you know, I knew right away that Carrie, um, she'd, lo- she'd been downsized from her job at an ad agency. She was an artist. She was trained as an artist, but she hasn't really done art, real art for a long time. And, she, and she's talked herself into thinking she's not good at it. And mm-hmm. Murphy, as you said, Murphy's kind of, he has ideas for the Christmas tree farm, but his dad doesn't want to hear them because there's only one way to do it the way we've always done it. So, you know, they go to the city and they, and they don't really know each other. They're, they're kind of estranged. And then they have to live in this little trailer and they have to not just live together. They got to work together. Yeah. And, um, there's nothing like, um, trying to tell a man how to do something. And so Carrie, (laughs) Carrie is fighting an uphill battle to get her brother 
to listen to the new ideas she might have about, hey, here's how we could sell some more Christmas trees. And here's how we could maybe do things a little bit differently. Right. And she's oh, it's so great. And I love that. I loved how you brought like, there's so many things about your books that I love. And just also not about your books, but about you and your life. And I love how there's like vintage clothes. And then she's making these beautiful wreaths. And I'm like, Oh, that's so nice. I just love that. I had to find something for her to do instead of sitting in a lawn chair waiting for somebody to come along and buy a Christmas tree. That was a brilliant idea. <laughs> I don't know if it was brilliant or not, but I thought, oh my gosh, what, you know, she's going to sit there and wait for someone to, and I'm not a passive person. You may have noticed. I I didn't, I didn't notice at all. I, I want you to talk about, um, Badger, oh. um, who is Maddie's best friend in the books and, and his real name is Steve, which is a perfectly nice name. Right. Why, why is he Badger? You know, I I, ne I never knew why his name is Badger. This is like such a this is like such a funny thing about my process and about the way I write. So she has a, you know she has this friend, and I knew that there was like you know something sort of deeper about their relationship, but I didn't know what it was when they first kind of wound up on the page. And I and I knew that he had this nickname that he found annoying, but that everybody in the town calls him, and that she calls him that. And that it's not a very nice name. And I, throughout the writing of the book, I was like, what is this guy's real name? And I just couldn't get to it until, in, until the, until the end of the, until the end of the book. And even now, I don't know who or why he was called, he was called Badger. I had a friend in college whose name was Weasel. Oh, really? <laughs> Was there a reason for it? Or? Yes, there was a reason. He was he was skinny and had glasses. Oh, and well, no, that wasn't the reason. He was drinking <laughs> beer with some friends, and uh, I guess whatever he was drinking, he spat it out and he said, "This tastes like weasel piss." And oh. ever after that, he was called Weasel. Oh wow! I'm, I, mean, I bet he didn't like that, right? Like probably not. Uh, no, he was fine with it. He was just Weasel. It was I, just and I think it like it just becomes your name and it just has like this you know this energy and this vibe and he's also like a it's also interesting because he's also kind of like a very low-key person so he's not like one to badger you know it's not like he's you know he's actually kind of just got to kind of prod him to do the things that he needs to do um but yeah I I I always I just let it I just let it ride and I didn't feel like I wanted to make up some reason why he was called that I was just right. like that's just who he is. And that's kind of how we got through the, through the book. Do you find yourself when you're, when you're naming your characters, do you have a, an intentional process or do you all of a sudden, well, they're just named that? Yeah. That's kind of the way it is for me that they're just, they're just named. I mean, I don't have any, like, I, I don't have any perspective on that part of the process like obviously I gave them their name right they're my characters I'm the author I I'm writing the book right but like where does that come from like why does that person have that name like I'm not sure why like I know some people are like oh I'm gonna read this I have this baby name book or you know I do yeah. this online or I want the name to have some kind of a certain meaning and I I I wish I could do things like that, but whenever I try to do things like that, then I always like there, there's always another name or usually another name that that character wanted to have. And I can't stop thinking about that, you know, that name that the character came with. And yeah. there have been times in the past where I've had to change a character name That's once for le once for legal reasons and once for, um, you know, just because it was too similar to it, like another name in the book and it was, you know, found to be confusing. So, and I never have been able to think about those characters in, in any other way as the name that I originally gave them, even though in the book, they have a totally different name. Yeah. Now with, with, um, Carrie in Bright Lights, Big Christmas, yeah. the, I did deliberately name her Carrie Claire because for many years, I thought my grandparents were Irish immigrants. My grandfather came from County Kerry yeah. and my grandmother, I thought, came from County Clare. It turns out a, a couple years ago, a cousin who went on, um, um, what's the website? Make me, me. Yeah. The, yeah. The one of those. Yeah. Um, found out my grandmother's actually from Armagh. 
And Carrie Armagh doesn't really work, but Carrie Claire has a sibilance to it that I liked. I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. That's a really cool name. And, is that yeah. how you is that how you think most of your names? Do they have meaning or do you they have meaning or they um they either have meaning or um the book that comes out next summer? I needed two, both of the women um are in their 40s, their early 40s, and I wanted them to have names from that era. So I have a Tracy and a Shannon. Right. Um, and then, um, but you know, I don't know about you, but you can't have names that everybody has today. Right. Like you can't have a Kristen because everybody is a Kristen or a Christy right. or a Jennifer or a Jessica. Right. That's true. That's true. You can't have those names. Right. There's just too many of them. That's true. That's true. What about Murphy? Uh, you... Murphy, just I knew he was Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, all right. Talk to me about. I mean, you said that Otto Penzler, who's sort of the godfather of the modern um, thriller or mystery, that he suggested you write a Christmas book. But talk to me about the idea of having a true crime podcaster. Yeah. And so, this very layered story that you came up with. Yeah. So I, I'm I, probably most of us are sort of crime podcast junkies, you know, like obviously, you know, things like serial or kind of the gold standard. And I think that, and, and it's definitely something that's kind of, you know, grabbed the moment, you know, it's definitely like sort of leaked into the zeitgeist of, you know, the, the, the thriller novel. I mean, of course I wasn't thinking about that at the time. It was just that, you know, I I had this idea about um, Harley Granger, who is this kind of un, you know maybe potentially unethical podcaster at the you know at the at the center of the book, and he is a failed fiction writer. So he was writing fiction, and he you know just it just wasn't doing very well. And he was kind of like at the end of his rope, and you know, didn't have a contract, and he winds up like having um um you know a drink with his with his uh friend Raj he was just like sort of made redundant at a national radio program and they decided that they're going to start doing this podcast and he finds that as an investigator and somebody who can weave a narrative into nonfiction that he actually has found his niche so he has a podcast and he has a best-selling books and he's also been responsible for reopening cases that uh, were, were cold and finding a resolution. And so that's like kind of, you know, I, I'm interested in this idea of the podcast for a couple of reasons. First of all, because in this very strange way, it harkens back or podcasts in general, it harkens back to like radio days. The right? golden age of radio. Exactly. So where there wasn't, you know, there wasn't any, you know, visual, there was no computer or television or nothing. You're, you got your stories. And then of course, before that, you know, from the oral tradition of storytelling. So this weird evolution, right? Like through the years where, you know, you have your oral tradition of history and storytelling, and then the golden age of radio. And then of course, it's just a morass now of like, like every possible input, you know, social media, television, all that stuff. And I feel like there's this weird return to the podcast, right? And I think it's like, maybe some of us are really tired, right? We're tired of like, our eyes are tired and we want to listen to these stories. And then when we talk about criminality, we're really talking about culture. We're talking about humanity, right? Because the criminality of any society tells you so much about that society. So I think in so many ways, we're using these crime podcasts to try to understand ourselves, try, and I think this is why people write crime fiction, crime fiction as well, because we're trying to understand ourselves. We're trying to understand why bad things happen and we're trying to narrate them in a way that we can understand. And so that whole idea of, of like narrating ourselves and, um, and telling stories about what's happened and how cases were solved. Right. Kind of harkens back to that, that oral tradition once again, because like Lee Child is famous for saying like, he thinks that the first story ever told was a thriller and we told it to ourselves around the fire. It was about how, you know, the, how the hunter fell the beast or the enemy was defeated. And there are stories that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel braver. 
in the dark. And I think that's true of podcasts. I think that's true of crime fiction. And I think it's definitely true for me as a writer that it's the place where I go to try to um, understand people and what they do. Yeah, I, I like that Harley, I mean, you clearly paint him as an opportunist from the very beginning. Yeah, a little bit. Yes. But um, but then he he's more nuanced than that. He is. Yeah, he's got some nice layers. Yeah. He's not a lost cause totally. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I mean, I think he's just a little bit like damaged. You know, I mean, he's you start to find out throughout the story, you just, like everybody, you know, you try to start to find out their layers, what makes them tick. And like, you know, you find out about his relationship with his dad and how he felt, you know, sort of very abandoned by his mother. And you start to get to understand him and understand what he's trying to do. Like he's, you know, is he an opportunist? Is he unethical? I mean, maybe, but maybe he's just trying to tell a story. Um, and, other people want to hear that story and other people are paying to hear that story. So is that, you know, is that opportunistic or is he just, you know, gaming the system, you know, like everybody else. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think he's gonna, I think he has, um, I think he has a future. So we'll see what happens. He has he, I definitely can see some potential with him. Yeah. Kind of, I like the way that you kind of left that, um, left that open for us that he doesn't die <laughs> oops no, did i give it away <laughs> spoiler alert spoiler alert. we don't know um talk about how you lay your christmas into this book yeah because that's not i mean i know you set out to write a christmas novella right. but um, it's not really about christmas well, I mean, I have to say that when I'm reading about her, her helpers in the store yeah. and wrapping gifts, I kept thinking about You've Got Mail with Meg yeah. Ryan. That's me. You know? Oh, of course. Yeah. I sort of thought like, you know, for me, Christmas is, I find Christmas very interesting. I don't know if you remember, I started Secluded Cabin Sleep Six at Christmas dinner. Right. Um, And, you know, it's you know, I feel like there's this kind of picture of Christmas, right? There's like this fairy tale Christmas idea that everybody gets sold, you know, and it's like this gathering of like family and everybody loves everybody and it's all like joy and support and all the stuff and like presents and laughter and all the stuff. And I feel like I don't know that many people who have a Christmas experience like that. And I feel like there's this idea of Christmas that is often very difficult for people who don't, don't have a good relationship with their family or who are suffering from trauma. The holidays are a very difficult time of year for people who are, are struggling with stuff. It's a, you know, it's a time I'm not going to get grim, but you know, it's a time of like, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with mental, with mental health issues, it's a difficult time for people and that there are, are, are reasons why like this, I, this perfect idea is almost like tyrannical in a way, right? Like yeah. it's not, like you're not just allowed to have whatever Christmas you had, you <laughs> You have to compare it to this like shiny, you know, Christmas like glitter ball or whatever. Yeah, and Instagram, Instagram ready Christmas. That's right. The Instagram ready Christmas. And I feel like, you know, that's so not true for people. So that was something that kind of came through for me. But um the title of the book, Christmas presents is, you know, it's meant to kind of harken back to other things as well, like presents, being present. And I think that. Um, in the case of, of this book and for Madeline's journey, especially, you know, she's locked in the, she's locked in the past. She's, even though she's tried to move forward, she's stuck in the past. A lot of the characters are stuck in the past and that it's these connections, these true connections of love and friendship and family that help us move into the present and to understand that, you know, even though there's been terrible loss, you know, there's still this moment and there's still beauty to be found. And so that was kind of my, you know, that was kind of my ultimate, like my journey through the darkness into the, into the light, hopefully in that, in that sense. Well, you did, you do give us some light there. Um, 
you know, you've got, you've got these missing girl cases, mm-hmm. which seem um, really chilling to me. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, you've got fractured families, um, mm-hmm. which I think is a theme in everybody's contemporary right. life. Um, Madeline's uh, mother is, is gone. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and, uh, you've got Badger and his brother, Chet. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about why Badger, um, fixes up class, classic cars. Do you know anything about classic cars, Lisa? I, I do not know. <laughs> I don't know anything about classic cars except that I think they're super, super cool. Yeah. And you turn up in my books quite a bit. And it's it's just something that like to me it's a it's a, it's kind of an energy, right? It's like a it's like a, an old thing made new again, which is a, one of my one of my favorite things. It's something that it might be run down and broken is suddenly like gleaming and operational again. Like I I love that idea. And I love like the, you know, um, the power of a, of a classic car, like the, you know, that rumble, that deep rumble of the engine. Muscle cars. Yeah. Muscle cars. I really love that sound and I love that feeling. And like, that is pretty much the extent of my knowledge. Of <laughs> cars. <laughs> but they, they turn up all the time, you know, and I tend to get like sort of very researchy about whatever particular car, like if there's a car that's you know, has a function, you know, like the scout, for example, I know quite a bit about the scout because it was another character of mine, Ian Payne and crazy love you had a scout. And I, so I know a little bit more about, about that because I just kind of want to understand, you know, not so much like, I don't care how it runs or anything like that. Like, just like, what is the vibe? Like, right. what kind of, and also like, what does it say about somebody? Like when you say somebody has this car, like, what does it say about that person? Like that, that really interests me because mm-hmm. we telegraph ourselves in a million different ways. Right. And so it's like when you have a car, especially, in, you know, for a certain generation and in this day and age, what does your car say about you? Yeah. Um, so that, that really interests me. Do you, do you know a lot about classic cars? Do you know anything? I don't, I know virtually nothing. We do own a classic 1972 MGB. Ooh. convertible um that we bought from a, one of my oldest friends uh stepfather restored it and he'd passed away and her mom wanted to sell it and I'm thinking god wouldn't I look cool tooling around in a 1972 MGB I um, yeah I would if I could drive the thing but the steering is you know I've been driving okay, there's no power steering it's yeah, like no power brakes everything right. is you know exactly. and the shift yeah. I, I can drive a five speed I learned to drive on a five speed Right. But, and so it looks really cute in our garage at this time. Tom, my husband drives it sometimes. Well, I do know. I have a vision of myself being cool and cute in it. Well, I'm sure and that that's more than enough really is yeah. the vision because you know, those cars are really not safe. And there is one detail that I do know about classic cars. And that is that the steering column um, used to be called the impaler. Yes. Mm-hmm. because it was a solid piece of metal and you know use your imagination but these days the steering column luckily breaks apart so yeah that's one thing I do know figures right <laughs> <laughs> so but tell me about spammy tell me about the vintage trailer in uh in in bright lights big Christmas Well, that was inspired by the real story. I read a story several years ago in the New York Times about a family from Vermont who every year for the past 40 years have taken this vintage camper from Vermont. They go to the the village, the same corner where where Carrie and Murphy are selling their trees, Mm -hmm. and they set up a Christmas tree stand and they live in that camper from the day after Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve. Now, the Vermont family were pretty different. Um, They didn't grow Christmas trees. This was just, they had, I think they were old hippies and they started doing this as a way, you know, make to make money. And it was originally the father and the mother, the husband and the wife. And they're, I think they had two kids and they lived in that camper in the village. And I, and I, and so I tracked them down when I decided, as soon as I saw that story, I thought, huh, I could do something with that. And so, um, we went and found them. I went up to New York last 
fall or the fall before I lose track. Mm -hmm. And we found his name is Billy Romp. Um, and I guess what happens if you live in, in a trailer with your husband for a, for a whole month, a reg, uh, that marriage will not last. I was going to say, I can imagine. Yeah. They, they are not married that's anymore. That's a book for me. Yeah, they're not married anymore, but he still goes with his adult son and his adult grandson and a nephew. Okay. And they, they're old hippies and they, you know, they play the mandolin, not a mandolin. They play something. They have an instrument they play. And I read about the neighbors taking them into their, taking them in and helping yeah. them with electricity and letting them, you know, use their bathroom. And I thought, okay, that's what I, I'm going to, my story will be very different. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea came from, um, finding and talking to Billy. I have pictures. I've got to use those. I've got to post those pictures at some point uh, where I went and interviewed him. And yeah. I also went and um, I went to um, the mountains of Western North Carolina and interviewed a Christmas tree farmer because I needed to know um, how do you grow a Christmas tree? How, how long does it take? What kinds of What's the worst thing that could happen on a Christmas? That's, that's on my list. That's on my list of questions. It's like, do you? How did you know all this about Christmas trees? I learned so much. I didn't know any of this stuff about Christmas trees. I, you know, as a washed-up recovering journalist, I'm great at <laughs> I'm great at calling up strangers or people people I know who know somebody who knows something, and yeah. um, I have no compunctions about approaching people and asking them yeah. extremely personal questions. Yes. So that was fun. Yeah, no, I, I, research is also a big part of my process. I, I really enjoy, um, that part of it, like a lot, you know, like just kind of digging into things like, you know, these days we have everything kind of at our fingertips, but that, at the, you know, in the, on the internet, but that's always like just the first layer for me. Right. Like then it's like, if you got to go deeper then you need a book, right. If you need to go deeper than that, then you've got to find somebody who is willing to just like sit down and talk to you about things. And you learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. And you know, lots of times I'll watch movies yeah, um, to just sort of set a scene in my head maybe mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah or get a vibe even yeah like definitely a vibe I, you like know here's vibe, like sometimes it's I listen to a movie soundtrack oh that's a good it's, idea yeah it's yeah it's a very it's a very vibey thing like if you hear certain music I just recently watched um just happened to rewatch Spy Game with Brad Pitt and Robert Redford just like an old movie I think uh, oldish it's like maybe I don't know maybe like 2001 or something and it was such, such a great movie and the soundtrack is that the one is that the one where they're um they're basically digital spies no no that's that's another one that Robert Redford was in I think that's called is that called sneakers that might be called yes sneakers. I love that one yes that's a great one too but this one is like they're you know they're they're agents in the middle yeah. east and it's and the the soundtrack is just absolutely brilliant and I've just been listening to it ever oh. since yeah and of so, course I'm over here listening to Mariah Carey all I want for Christmas is you <laughs> <laughs> well that has a vibe too and Santa <laughs> baby you know Santa baby of course which is a very controversial song yes yes there's a lot of songs that are being recast yeah in, in a new light yeah, like I was just watching. Did, have you watched um, Only Murders in the Building? Of course. Yeah. So do you like when she's talking about um, he, he, Martin Short is saying, you know, Sting, every breath you take, the greatest love song ever written. And she's like, well, no, it's, it's about, about stalking. You're stalking somebody. <laughs> yeah, that's like a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? The other song, um, not just Santa Baby, but. Um... Oh. Um, the baby it's cold baby, it's cold outside which you know it's been cast as a very rapey song but if you know yeah. the history of the song yeah. it's a husband and a wife wrote it to perform at a Christmas party with all their other singer songwriter friends yeah and they did it you know as a duet yeah and it was very you know of the time and charming and yeah, it's sly it's sly and funny now if you look at it now it's like oh my god he just roofied her <laughs> so you do have a dark mind oh I, I yeah I, I mean I have a dark mind okay 
Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, bit. you can't just write straight. No. Right. You have to have shadow or you can't see the sunlight. No, exactly. A hundred percent agree. hundred. I did have to, I had to cut a scene out of this book um, because it was too dark. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. There's a little boy in the book and um, I had a scene where. I'm not he, totally finished yet. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. finished. Okay. But, yeah. But there's I, a scene where he's endangered and my editor flipped out. No, no, you can't put him in any danger. <laughs> yeah no I, I hear that <laughs> it's like don't kill the cat don't you can't do that that's right in my in my book everybody's in danger so it's like if somebody's not in danger then my editor wants to cut that scene <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say to her you know something bad does have to happen in this book <laughs> no a child no no it's a, that's not true it's a, yeah. maybe there could be the threat of something bad happening yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's really I just love it I, I love your writing I just think it's so well, yeah, Debbie uh, back says, at you. nobody does Christmas like Mary Kate Andrews except that you know people always ask me hey are they going to make a Hallmark movie out of this and usually the answer is probably not because I uh, my my characters are grown-ups and they have sex yeah <laughs> they don't do that they don't do that in Hallmark movies no no, and and I think that yeah, I, that there's definitely it's definitely not Hallmark. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with a Hallmark movie, but your books are not. They're very layered, and your characters. Oh, and thanks. Characters well, are, I want to write. I want to write. You know, three dimensional characters, and they're adults. And and besides those, I don't like to write sex scenes. I like to write um, flirty, banter, yeah. banter for banter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, love I, mean, to, I love to find ways why they can't have sex. Right. Yeah, that's fun. Exactly. Yeah. Keep, the, keep the tension going. Yeah. <laughs> Sexual tension. The moonlighting thing. That's right. <laughs> moonlighting. Um, I'm, I'm going to peek into the questions here. Okay. Um, I think, oh, so this is a good question from Katie. Hi, Katie. She asks, do you like writing novellas? Yeah, they're shorter. <laughs> but, you know, I had to cut this book by like two, uh, 75 pages. I have to say, it's long. This is pretty long. It's almost novel length, right? It is It is novel length. I mean, I, yeah. I read a lot of novels that are the length of this. So I had written it. It was 75 pages longer. And my editor was like, yeah, this was supposed to be a novella. And then I slapped myself in the head and said, you didn't get paid for a novel. <laughs> you got paid for a novella. So let's That's wrap right. it up. Yeah, let's wrap, let's it up. wrap it up how about you did you like did you enjoy the process you know I do I love writing novellas and uh short stories so and I just and, and to be honest I recently I only recently just kind of fell in love again with that form I used to write short stories when I was a kid and you know when I before I started my first novel um which I started when I was 19 years old and so once I found my voice, like in the form of the novel, like I didn't really experiment that much with short fiction. I had been asked to contribute some things to anthology. So I did that um, and I enjoyed those experiences, but it was um, more recently with a, a short story that I wrote called The Sleep Tight Motel that I really just fell in love with the short form. And so I've been doing short stories um, and novellas, um, you know, I guess now like pretty much every year for the last five or six years in addition to my novels. And I can't write two novels at the same time, but I find that I can I can write a short story while I'm writing a novel. I can write okay. a novella while I'm writing a novel and it feels like a completely other universe that I go to. And there's like a different energy and it's like this very, I usually have like most of it in my head before I ever sit down to write. Like I'm not an outliner, but somehow with the short fiction, like it kind of, it presents itself like as a whole thing. And it's just kind of this very propulsive, like I have to write this. Like I wrote a short story when I was on vacate when I was on vacation this summer. Like it was just something that popped into my head. I was like, I got to get it down on fever yeah and exactly. that's what happens with the short stuff I find writing a short story so difficult 
Mm. And you would think as a washed up journalist, I would be able to write short form. Right. The opposite is true. I need, I need a lot of, mm. need a lot of elbow room for my plot. Right. right. Yeah. I, and I feel that way about the, you know, my novels, it's like, you know, it's a year, it's a year, of, it's, it's a relationship, it's vision and revision, it's good days and bad days, you know, and right. it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a marriage in a sense. And, you know, your my short stuff is like, like a fling or an affair. Sorry, Ooh. honey. Your side boy. Your side boy. So naughty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the naughty list again. <laughs> oh my God. That's a perfect, that's a perfect Christmas uh, anthology. The naughty list. The naughty list. Okay. Let's do it. Let's put it together. All right. Okay. okay. Done. Great. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so what? Uh, so Katie asks, what author inspires you? Oh, me? Well, uh, us. She's asking. Okay. <laughs> what, what what author inspires you? Well, you know, it's interesting. I I recently just did. Um, I was the guest editor for the Best American Mystery and Society. Saw that. Yeah, and um, I wrote an essay about uh, short fiction, and one of the authors that came up, and I have a lot of authors that inspire me. I mean, I'm a lifelong reader, and I'll, like so many of our friends are mm -hmm. just amazingly talented authors, right? And I'm constantly inspired by my friends, and you know, even even some people I don't know. <laughs> but like for me, like my first the 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 place where I fell in love with story and language and character was with Truman Capote in a, a book called Other Voices, Other Rooms, which is like mm -hmm. a collection of short vignettes. Yeah. Um, and like there, are, some of them are fiction, some of them are nonfiction. And we all know Truman Capote had like a very layered relationship with the truth. And, you know, and he did want, he did write, you know, what must be the first true crime story ever written in, in Cold Blood. Right. And that book was something that I read very early and like kind of inappropriately early. Me and too. I read it when I was like, I read yes. it when I was probably like 10 or 12. It was horrible. Yeah. Way too young. And I, and in a lot of ways though, I think it formed me as a writer, you know, because it gave me permission to explore the darkness, mm -hmm. right? I do it with compassion and empathy and, you know, with a, like a love of character and language. And I feel like I've carried that with me um, as a writer and, you know, aspire to that in all of my work. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, um, I started writing crime fiction mystery under my real name, which is Kathy Hogan Trocheck. Those books have all been rebranded as Mary Kay Andrews, but my grandfather read Pulp Fiction. So every Sunday he would, we go to their house and he would hand my mother um, a brown paper bag full of Pulp Fiction. So it would be Earl Stanley Garner and um, Mickey Spillane and John D. McDonald. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm reading Mickey Spillane as a like a 10 year old, not <laughs> understanding, you know, what's going on? Why every time does he come back to his place and there's a nude blonde in his bed? Why doesn't he lock the door? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Did not occur to me. Exactly. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, um, Agatha Christie, who, you know, uh, got me interested in the sort of the locked room mystery. Yeah. And um, so I've had some bizarre literary influences. And then, um, you know, when I was started writing mysteries, it was sort of the second golden age. So it was Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton yeah. and Marsha Muller, who, oh, yeah. who were really for the first time, women were making headway um, in selling books and and make and bestseller lists. So you know they those were really were, the trail. They were really the trailblazers. They really laid absolutely. the road for everyone that came after them, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then you know I'm a huge still to this day. I used to when I started a book, I would I read the first few paragraphs of an Elmore Leonard book mm, because yeah. nobody gets you into the story as fast. Right as fast and there's no other hook like an Elmore Leonard hook yeah yeah to me That's so great. those are some of my you wouldn't think that those were the literary influences for a book like this well I think it's interesting that it's like you know I my parents were my mom was a librarian my dad you know was an engineer and 
my mom, they, but they're both huge readers. Like my dad just read only nonfiction and my mom, you know, only fiction. And they had like these gigantic bookshelves all the time and there was zero censorship, right? Yeah. Like if I could reach it, I could read it. Like there no one could stop me. So it was like Sidney Sheldon and V.C. Andrews and Stephen King and like really just, you know, anything, you know, that I wanted to read, I was reading it. And then, you know, I had different tastes as I, as I grew up, but like, I was really formed with that, you know, very like, you know, pop fiction and yeah. also, you know, like some literary influences as well, you know, and especially later on. Um, but it was just, you know, I think that that's maybe part of it is just that you're, you know, you're just allowed to read and you just find your way into these big stories. Yeah. And that's why I, you know, I feel so strongly Everywhere I've been on book tour, I see librarians and um, I just think it's it's terrifying, the book banning and people, I know. people deciding what other people uh, can read. Right, exactly. I know. And I think it's interesting, too, because like I we were, I had a book group meeting this week and I was saying that I I don't think there's any author that I know that doesn't point to a teacher or a librarian Absolutely. who help them discover who they are, who supported them or as a writer or both. And I think that, you know, these professions are, are you know, very sort of under underappreciated. I mean, they're very appreciated in our profession, but yeah. like I think in general, like people don't realize, like, you know, these are the people that are like on the front line, front, the front lines of humanity. Right. And libraries like provide these the safe space for for readers um, and a place where kids who, you know, can't afford books can always go and get a book, you know, and I think that that's such a critical, uh, a critical piece of our of our culture and our society. I definitely agree. Definitely agree. So we ask some more questions from the. See, I've got. OK, so. um. So uh, Katie says, sounds like so many great characters in these books. Which one was the most fun to write and why? You go first while I think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I, I had a lot of fun with Harley. I found him, very, I enjoyed my time with him very, very much because I was just like, dude, what are you up to? <laughs> he was just like, he was so you know, he was so kind of like snarky. I also liked Raj, his friend, because they were both like kind yeah. of snarky and funny and stupid and like, you know, just kind of, you know, goofing around and being jerks. But they both had these like kind of interesting layers to them. And so they were funny and they were also interesting. And I kept, you know, waiting for the next layer to be revealed, like, you know, and um, and to see new, new aspects and nuances of his character um so I, I enjoyed my time with him but I you know I have to say it's not I couldn't say that he's a favorite because you know I'm always very deeply very you know deeply connected to all of them yeah um Murphy was kind of fun to write um yeah. because he doesn't really know how to communicate very well yeah, it's really like it, it's yeah. grunts and and um so he was kind of fun to try to um, unpeel and um, you know his sister describes him as looking as like the guy on the bounty paper towel roll yeah <laughs> but um, you know he finally, he finally what was the name of his her. instrument it was a a mandolin no a dobro a dobro, dobro so d-o-b-r-o so yeah I had I had to look that up <laughs> it's a it's a they use it a lot in um like bluegrass and, and zydeco and, and 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 folk music yeah southern appalachian folk music yeah 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 it's a little it's a little yeah super cool yeah. so do you know did you know anything about that or was that just his instrument no it just seemed like he would he would be a big man playing a small instrument yeah <laughs> i like okay. it hey yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a really cool um aspect of his personality that he was musical I yeah. and she's also artistic as well I mean we knew she was artistic but it's it was an it was a nice reveal about a nice reveal mm -hmm. of one of his layers that he right. had. and she didn't know that he was musical because they hadn't lived together in so long yeah exactly uh, okay somebody else says um 
Uh, what's the ballpark for cozy mysteries? Well, um, in terms of, length? I guess length. Yeah. Oh, oh, like for like a novella. Well, I think that the general rule for novellas is less than two hundred pages. I mean, Except I just I just did two hundred and yeah, two hundred pages too. Um, but like I think that that's the general. That's the general rule for novella is under 200 pages. But like, you know, I mean, these things are very, you know, they're very big. <laughs> I think it takes as long as it takes. But once yeah. you, once you go, once you go speeding past the 300 page mark. Yeah, then you're, you're fully in novel territory. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get paid for a novel, so I had to cut it back. <laughs> and actually publishers, Publishers are being more careful with papers and short. No, that's true. Printing. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like a weird thing now. Yeah. Oh, here's a good one. Hmm. Any pub day rituals? Today's your pub day. Lisa, I mean, do you have a pub day ritual? I don't really have a, I don't really have a pub day ritual. I, I'm not like a ritual type person. You know, I always feel like, you know, like people are like, do you have a ritual for when you, you know, finish your novel or do you have a ritual so that you can sit down and write your novel or whatever? So I don't really, I don't have any rituals, but what I do really try to do, and I did this this morning, is just kind of be present um, for a little while with the fact that my book is, has been published because, you know, I was a kid writer. I never wanted to do anything else with my life. And every single time I get a, my book published, I feel just profoundly grateful that yeah. I am able to make my living doing what I love. And it's just such a gift and a blessing. And so a lot of times in this business, it's always like, go, go, go. What's next? What's next? What's bigger? What's better? Yeah. And you know, you're always on to the next thing and the next thing in this post and that, you know, what, you know, what's going to come up the pike or whatever. And to just kind of stop and just be grateful is a ritual that I try to have on pub day. Like, you know, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle that I get to do what I love to do, you know? And um, I try to be present for that when I can. That's great. That's great. That's way more intentional and thoughtful and civilized. Than I, what I do. Okay, what do you, so what's your ritual? <laughs> <laughs> I wake up and see and make sure that nobody dropped a uh, one-star review for me on any <laughs> review site. I've had it happen. Don't you think people do that like on purpose? Like there's trolls out there. They start yeah. off the day with a one-star review and you're like, really? Like, was it that bad? Like, there's no way it was that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever posted a one-star review for anything. I would never do that. You have to be a special kind of terrible person to do that to a writer. Like, I would never, ever write a bad review about any other writer's book because it is just absolutely subjective. Right, keep it to yourself. That's right. If you don't know, you don't know what, you're no authority on this, right? Like, I'm no authority. I certainly wouldn't, like, say this book is no good. Like I may privately think that something is not for me, but like to go out there and leave mean words um, on an author's page is like, it's just plain mean. I'm sorry. There's yeah. no, there's no other way to look at it. No haters gonna hate and taters gonna hate. <laughs> Any other rituals? Like, Oh, you don't even want to know my, I have rituals for my rituals. <laughs> like, do you drink like a, do you drink like a cup of eggnog or something? Like, <laughs> No, no, um, no, I'm, I'm only, you know, because we get obsessed with our rankings, our online rankings. So I limit myself. I'm only allowed to check my online rankings twice a day at one. <laughs> at, at, I'll, okay. I'll admit it. Seven times a day. That's it. That's my absolute. Limit. No, just twice a day. Um, at seven twenty-seven a.m. and seven twenty-seven p.m. Okay. I am allowed. I'm allowed to check my online ranking because those are my lucky numbers. Okay, I like that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I can I can go past it. Like if I'm doing something and I forget, um, <laughs> then I can I can do it later. But I cannot jump the line and do it earlier. That's a little... you can do it later, but you can't do it earlier. No, you cannot do it earlier. Okay. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> 
Okay. I, I think, oh, here's Louisa. I was just oh, here's the sheriff. <laughs> She's like, I'm here with the hug. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love, I love hearing that. I thought this was a perfect note to end on. Although I did see that somebody asked and I'd love to hear the answer to what you are working on next. Yeah. You want to go ahead, MK? Yeah, I've got um, a new novel coming out uh, first Tuesday in May. It's called Summers at the Saint, S-A-I-N-T. And um, it's about um, a, a, a small but exclusive family-owned resort on the Georgia coast. And there's an old unsolved death and a new murder. Ooh. And roman romance and all the things. And all, all the all the things, all the sparkling mm -hmm. things we love in your book. That's fabulous. And Lisa, what's what's coming up for you? Um, yeah. So my my next book comes out in March, uh, twenty twenty four, and it is called The New Couple in Five B, and it's a young couple who inherits a apartment in an iconic New York City building, and there's a bunch of creepy neighbors and some very like sort of dark and creepy things going on in the building. And, um, you know, Rosie has to, she's a true crime writer, so she has to figure out what that, what's going on before um, it, she falls under the spell of the Winder Mirror, which is the name of the building. I love it. We can plan uh, to be terrified in the spring by you, Lisa, and then made to feel comforted by right. uh, comforted. Mary Kay. Oh, I'm going to put you through some stuff, though, now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to make you work for it. Yeah. Well, it, it, the payoff is just so much sweeter than in the end. Yeah. <laughs> I so appreciate this. This was such a fun and wonderful conversation between you both. And really, thank you for being here. And thank congratulations you. on both of your novellas. We are looking forward to sharing them with all of our favorite mystery readers and general readers out there because everybody should be reading these books. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Book Passage does have signed copies of Lisa's books, and we will have signed book plates from Mary Kay Andrews. Thank you, everybody, for being here today, and I hope we'll see you at future virtual events. Thank you.